everyone. This is Dr. Sharin Tofai. I am coming to you from Beverly Hills, California. Um, hope you're all well. Muchísimas gracias a Evelyn, a Professor Dorado, por su invitación a mí. Y uh, me siento muy honrado de ser parte de su, su diploma por hernias. Um, espero visitar Colombia en el futuro. Ojalá. Uh, hasta entonces estoy agradecida por la oportunidad de compartir mis conocimientos hoy. Esta conferencia será en inglés. Discúlpeme, mi inglés es mucho más mejor que mi español. Entonces, esto se llama Radiology in Inguinal Hernia, Approach and How to Interpret the Results. Um, as you may all know, uh, my specialty is in hernia surgery as a general surgeon, and I am very, very much involved in treating patients that um, have hidden hernias or chronic groin pain. It's very difficult to figure that, that part of the diagnosis out unless they actually have a um, form of imaging. And so it's very important that the right imaging is ordered in many cases that are complicated or difficult um, and cannot be diagnosed on examination only. And so today I will discuss exactly what um, I use and how that will help you. So I have learned to become my own radiologist. Um, I don't trust radiologists as I've done more and more of this. I've learned that I can read better than most radiologists in my own little field of hernias. And so um, I specifically read my own images as part of uh, my evaluation. And the reason for that is uh, we published our data looking at all these images that I see uh, that the patients provide to me. And um, I disagree with the interpretation by the radiologist. 75% of the um, reports that come with the imaging studies for my patients are incorrect. And we um, analyze why they are incorrect. Most often, they just don't even discuss the hernia. They don't even mention whether they looked for a hernia. And in those that do mention it, it's often incorrect in that they see no hernia. So a um, couple years ago, we gave our first set of data. There's a new paper coming out updating this with a little bit more um, patience and evaluation. But specifically, uh, what we saw is that the true positives are very, very um, low. And looking at all inguinal hernias, uh, you can see here only 29% of the reports were truly positive. All the other um, uh, other, all the other uh, reports were incorrect. Um, and in addition, the, uh, the, we looked at people with occult inguinal hernias, and those are people that you can't even examine their groin. There's no real finding. There's no bulge, for example. They may be tender in the inguinal uh, canal region, maybe very slightly edematous in the area, um, and you have a high suspicion for inguinal hernia, but you cannot say for sure they have one. And when we look at those patients, which were subclassified in occult inguinal hernias, radiology reports are even worse with only a 17% true positive, which means that you really cannot rely on the report themselves to accurately diagnose inguinal hernias, which is very important Therefore, as general surgeons, for you to learn how to read your own imaging. And we'll spend some time today discussing that. So in the next um, uh, moment, we will go over all the diagnostic studies and um, tips on how to interpret and order the images correctly. And we'll also go over some non-hernia causes for groin pain. So x-ray is a very good study, typically not for inguinal hernias itself, but, but the, it is for people who have groin pain. You can look at an x-ray and help determine why someone has um, 
uh, groin pain of, of a certain uh, for a certain reason. So this is a typical X-ray obese lady, and she's got severe right lower quadrant pain after her laparoscopic angular hernia repair. And if you look carefully, she has all of these tacks. I think we measured I think over 16 tacks, all placed in um, the right lower quadrant. And this potentially may be the cause of her chronic groin pain. So a simple x-ray in certain um, patients may be very helpful to diagnose the reason for their groin pain. X-rays for hip-related um, groin pain can also help evaluate whether this is a pain uh, related to, let's say, uh, the groin, or you know there are other diseases such as sacroiliac, disease, hip disorders that can be evaluated on x-ray um, very easily. So one common um, uh, diagnosis that some patients may have that gives them groin pain is a hip diagnosis and oftentimes it's what we call FAI, femoroacetabular impingement. The impingement is when you get injury at the groin level. There may be an associated labral tear and at that point, what happens is you get overgrowth and therefore uh, impingement of the hip joint with the pelvic, um, pelvic bone. And you either get a bone spur, uh, an overgrowth, or a misshapen femoral head. Here's an x-ray of a pincer type of um, overgrowth. So this area here, this little extra ledge of of a bone can be such that when you um, when you uh, abduct your hip in a certain way, it can pinch over and be restricted by that bone, and it can cause pain. Another type is the cam type, where uh, the actual hip joint here is fine, but with repeated um, repeated injury, you get overgrowth of bone uh, at the uh, uh, femur itself and so you get this cam type deformity and so depending on where this deformity is rotation at the hip can can impinge uh, on the pelvic bone and, and cause um, cause pain remember this area overlaps with the inguinal canal and so many patients will point to their inguinal canal to um, describe where their pain is but in fact the the area of injury is much deeper than the inguinal level, more at the hip level, and there are a variety of um, uh, physical examination findings you can do to help differentiate hip pain from true inguinal or groin pain. Ultrasound is a very, very good um, modality to evaluate for groin pain. Now, here is the issue that um, we have in the United States which you may not have in Central and South America, uh, which is that we're not very good at ultrasound. Um, CT scans and MRIs have taken over the country. They're, they're much cheaper than they used to be, and they're much more readily available. Pretty much every emergency room has at least um, the, a CT scan readily available, and MRIs are pretty, uh, pretty um, uh, easily available. So what has happened with time is that the ultrasonographers are no longer that good and um, uh, we are relying less and less on ultrasound. That said, ultrasound is an excellent, excellent, excellent modality. It's done correctly to help evaluate the groin. Here's a nice video of a hernia uh, going through the inguinal canal and you can see that uh, the fat is following through the inguinal canal uh, and it's shown very nicely. The whole point of an ultrasound is that it should be done uh, in a dynamic fashion. The patient should often be encouraged not just to make a valsalva, but also to get up um, and move around as the ultrasonographer is ultrasounding the groin and stand and uh, move the hip around and um, perform valsalva maneuvers and um, in the United States, they just don't do a good job of, uh, of that, unfortunately. So here is what we were seeing is that this is the intra-abdominal portion of the ultrasound. The, the ultrasound machine is up here. This is your soft tissue. 
and you're seeing the inguinal canal with um, the hernia defect being this region here and fat is going through it uh, in a di and you can see that in a very nice dynamic way. Ultrasound again, very, very good study to evaluate for groin pain. Uh, and you, you saw nicely in the video how the fatty content was going through the inguinal canal. Let's review that again. This You can see the, the fat going in and pushing out through the inguinal canal. Very nicely done ultrasound, nicely capturing this. I personally do not like getting ultrasounds for people who have already had hernia surgery. There's a lot of distortion of the... Um, findings by the implanted mesh, if they've had a mesh already in their inguinal uh, canal. Um, I think that uh, here's a picture, for example, of preperitoneal mesh uh, performed laparoscopically. It's in good position. Here's your muscular layers, uh, soft tissue layers. Uh, they're evaluating it, but you really don't get a very good um, sense of whether the mesh is balled up or if there's a hernia recurrence because there is artifact uh, with the, um, uh, from the mesh and the scar tissue from the operation, if it's an open operation. I do not like to order ultrasounds for patients who have groin pain or concern for uh, hernia recurrence um, uh, after uh, their hernia repair with mesh. I think we have better modalities for that. However, if you have a very good ultrasonographer, it is a good study. So it is the perfect study in that it's fairly cheap. There's no radiation involved. Um, it's a dynamic study. Um, that's how it should be done. It gives you pretty good evaluation of the soft tissue. You don't need a very deep evaluation for groin pain uh, for hernias and ultrasound is often adequate. Um, it's cheap in, uh, everywhere. I believe it's very readily available in, in almost every country. Um, and it's a very rapid way of coming up to a diagnosis. Again, it's very operator dependent in the United States. It's rare to find a really good ultrasonographer for hernias. Um, they often do not know how to do a, a good hernia ultrasound. I have one radiologist in my town who is um, very, very, uh, um, he's in love with hernias, kind of like I am. So what he does is he is a radiologist and he himself performs the ultrasounds. Um, oftentimes, at least in the United States, we do not have that luxury. The patient uh, undergoes uh, ultrasound by a, a technologist that is dis disconnected from the radiologist and then the images are transmitted to the radiologist for final evaluation. And so it's kind of a little bit, you know, um, uh, not the best uh, because there's no direct interaction between the patient and the radiologist for the ultrasound. And that is a very um, useful way of, of getting a good, good rapport. When we looked at the ultrasounds uh, provided to us, um, we noticed that uh, an ultrasound was very good if it showed something. So if an ultrasound showed a hernia, uh, the patient had a hernia. I, do, I would not repeat any imaging uh, outside the ultrasound if you can get your diagnosis with an ultrasound. So the, um, the true positive rate and the positive predictive value of a ultrasound is very high, pretty, pretty much 100%. The problem is uh, oftentimes it's, it's negative uh, or uh, they can't find a hernia. That does not mean they don't have a hernia. It means the radiologist or the technologist was not able to elicit one by ultrasound. That may be very technique dependent. So if you do have a highly suspicious um, examination and history concerning for uh, hernia in someone with groin pain, then I would recommend moving on to another uh, imaging modality. The sensitivity on ultrasonography is, is um, pretty low, 0 0.56. Um, and the lowest of all the uh, of all the uh, patients evaluated uh, in our study. So when I order an ultrasound, um, I order a specifically a hernia ultrasound. It should be I try to write dynamic hernia ultrasound 
Um, most people order an abdominal ultrasound in the United States. That is not going to give you the answer that will show you that the gallbladder has gallstones or if the kidneys are the normal size. Um, they will not typically hone in on a hernia. And so uh, very specifically, the order should be done for a dynamic hernia ultrasound. And, you know, I try my best to communicate with, with um, I have patients from all over the nation that come to me. And so uh, I don't know if they have good ultrasonographers or what kind of protocol they have for, for hernia ultrasounds. So I try and put in my orders, I mean, read this, dynamic ultrasound, right, lower quadrant, abdominal wall and groin. I'm trying to be like, this is what I'm looking for. Um, please have the patient mark the areas of their pain and please do the ultrasound with Valsalva, different maneuvers, standing, etc. I'm trying to communicate with the ultrasonographer that I'm looking for an incisional or angle hernia. And of course, um, this is what I get. They're all confused. You've got multiple phone calls coming back and forth. And then at the end, they still did an abdominal wall ultrasound, which is not what I wanted. And, and um, you know, there's just a lot of miscommunication about these things. Um, ultrasound is good at uh, ruling out other reasons for groin pain. For example, uh, you know, here's a testis uh, where it's being um, evaluated. And this is the Doppler ultrasound looking at blood flow at this level of the spermatic cord down towards the testis. And if you look here, you see uh, quite a bit of uh, vascularity, most consistent with a varicocele. A varicocele can be painful. It can cause um, uh, groin pain in some patients, uh, oftentimes with some uh, testicular pain associated with it as well. You know, I use ultrasound guided nerve blocks. I think it's very, very useful. Um, the ultrasound is a great modality to, uh, to do ultrasound guided procedures. If you think a patient has groin pain due to a neuropathic cause and you would like to um, specifically block a nerve, here we're blocking the um, lateral femoral cutaneous nerve. Here's the inguinal ligament. Uh, the needle goes right deep to it and um, it's, it's attacking the uh, uh, lateral femoral cutaneous nerve as it goes um, infrainguinally. Uh, if that is a, if you need, let's say, ilioinguinal nerve block, iliohypogastric nerve block, or specifically like a genital femoral nerve block, that is a genital femoral nerve block is very difficult to do, um, especially in the retroperitoneal space, and I use an ultrasound for that process. So that's very helpful uh, use of ultrasound. Well, the most common imaging that is done for groin pain is the CAT scan in the United States. Um, uh, I assume it's, it's similar in, in your countries. Um, it's very readily available here. It's fast. The cost of CAT scans is just a couple hundred dollars um, in the U.S. And most surgeons are so comfortable reading CAT scans. They actually, and doctors are, are comfortable with the CAT scans. So, what they feel is that they, you know, they are very comfortable with it. Let's just order a CT scan and um, see what it shows. And um, unfortunately, it's not the best study for, for groin pain. Uh, the pelvis is not the best study by a CT scan. Here I'm going to scroll through some images in the pelvis of a CT scan. These are axial images. The patient has had oral contrast, as you can see, uh, with the intestines lighting up. And uh, we're basically focusing in these two areas. Uh, this is a rectus muscle. Um, the white, as you know, is bone, so here are your hip, hip joints. This is a bladder. There was IV contrast, so there's contrast in the bladder from the IV contrast. Um, the rectum is back here. Here's your sacral bone. But again, we're looking at anteriorly at the groin area, so here's your two rectus muscles and your oblique muscles on the side. So, um, Let's look at uh, this area. This is a pretty normal area, it looks like, on the CT scan. Nice muscle going across, no holes. Um, but look at here. You see right on the patient's left side, remember this is left. The left side, there's an abnormality that you do not see on the right side. It is right next to these two brightly lit uh, structures that you also see on the right side. This is a femoral uh, 
artery and femoral vein. Again, femoral artery, femoral vein. This would be a femoral space. Um, and here you see the contents, which is the spermatic cord, going down towards the testicles and adjacent to it. Infrainguinally is um, is a uh, some type of content. So we're going to have to figure that out. Uh, but to me, this would be a femoral hernia. Here is the same image of the same patient. This is what we call coronal cuts. The first one was an axial cut. Um, so here we have the, uh, the first set of images. These are your two rectus muscles, left and right rectus. You already see in the upper abdomen, there's intestines with content in it. Um, here you have the, uh, the groin, uh, obviously the right leg, left leg. This is, these are, um, this is penis and the uh, testes. So here you have your oblique muscles coming out on the sides. And this is basically what you have of your inguinal canal. And it looks pretty normal. All you have going through it is your, right, uh, is your left and right spermatic cord uh, going down to their respective testes. So this is a normal inguinal canal. There's no content within this inguinal canal. The content would usually be Fat, which is uh, this dark gray color, you don't see any of it. It's a collapsed inguinal canal. What you do see, which you already saw in the axial views, is um, is the uh, disparity in the left side where you have this content, nothing on the right side. And so you need to scroll down further um, to see what's going on. Again, inguinal canal is uh, is pretty much normal. Um, there's a little bit of fat in there, but, but it's not wide. Rectus muscles are here. Um, you're getting down to the pubic uh, symphysis here, uh, also normal. And then you see this abnormality on the left side. So here you are. This is the abnormality. This is your femoral hernia. Here you have your femoral artery, femoral vein, right side of femoral artery, femoral vein. The femoral space is immediately adjacent to it and medial. And you'll see that you have a loop of intestine that's going straight through. This is contrasting the intestine. Here's a little bit of air in the intestine. This is the um, uh, uh, inguinal canal, sorry, inguinal ligament. And you can see uh, just a, just a superior to it, you, you have your, um, sorry, just deep to it, you have your femoral hernia. So this is basically a femoral hernia. Again, here's the bladder in the middle, in the intestines, which all otherwise all look normal. I do not see intestinal obstructions. This is not, this is not an obstructing uh, femoral hernia, but it does have content. So we saw the axial and the sagittal views. Now we have what's called, sorry, uh, and the coronal views, and now we have what's called the sagittal views. So this is the uh, left side. Uh, we first encounter the pelvis and the, and the hip bone, which is bright white. On the back here is the buttock. And in the front, uh, this is your groin crease here and, and kind of yeah, the upper abdomen. So here we go. You see this content going straight underneath the inguinal ligament. So here's the inguinal canal with a little bit of fat in it. Here's the rest of the inguinal, um, the transverse abdominis and the inguinal ligament. And then here is a content under the inguinal canal um, following the uh, femoral vessels, uh, which are right here just lateral to it. And uh, this is, again, a, a femoral hernia uh, with the contents coming in intra-abdominally. And that's the intestine involved, and there's a little piece of air in the intestine. So let's review this again. CT scan for the groin pain. You got the white, which is the, the, uh, the bone. Here's the coccyx, pub uh, pelvic bone, the two hips right and left. Here's your rectus muscles inserting on the pubic tubercle. Right and left spermatic cord look normal. Right uh, femoral space empty. Left femoral space has content in it, also uh, what we call a uh, femoral hernia. And on the coronal view, uh, this is the content the, uh, going through the femoral space, um, which, is, which is intestine. Again, femoral artery, femoral vein, femoral space. On the right side, you have femoral artery, femoral vein, a little lymph node there but no content in the, on the right side, it's all on the left side. Normal bladder, normal intestines. And lastly, on the sagittal view, here's your rectus muscles coming down, that's your inguinal canal, 
uh, obliques and underneath the uh, ingle uh, ligament is your content uh, going through. So how is CT scan to help evaluate these? Um, you know, it's so easy to order that CT scan, um, but you have to do it with a grain of salt. If you want to do it for a quick fix diagnosis, feel free to do it. I don't order CT scans for most pelvic uh, problems because the numbers are just not good. Look at the numbers we have here. Negative predictive value, 4%. Specificity, 25%. It is not a good study um, looking for ingual hernias. If it shows a hernia, great. Um, but it just often does not. Um, and actually, let me, let me rephrase that. It's not that it doesn't show it. Uh, oftentimes, it does not. Especially for occult hernias, just don't get it. You're not going to be able to see an ingual hernia that's small. You will see the big ones. You won't see the small ones. Um, and uh, however, the other issue is even the kind of the medium to big ones, uh, they may be seen on CT scan, but the radiologist will not report it. So if you get a CAT scan and all you're doing is reading the radiology report, which is what my study was showing, uh, you're going to find that most of them will, will either not mention a hernia um, or will incorrectly say there is no hernia when there is one. And so um, do not rely on the CT scan for an, uh, if there's a negative result. If you have a physical examination or clinical suggestion of an ingual hernia, uh, especially the small ones, um, read the CT scan yourself. And then if you can't, still can't find the, C, uh, the imaging uh, to show a hernia, but you still suspect it, uh, move on to either an ultrasound or an MRI. So again, um, the positive predictive value is high, 96%. So if it shows a hernia, it's, it's highly reliable. Um, if the radiologist says there's a hernia, uh, most likely uh, they're correct 96% of the time. The problem is that they're often, uh, they're often quote, negative, um, and that negative uh, diagnosis is incorrect. Uh, so either you should read it yourself um, and learn how to read CAT scans to overrule your radiologist and maybe work with your radiologist to get the right diagnosis and if that doesn't work then what you should do is um, uh, move on to a better study because the use of CT scan is just highly un unreliable um, I look at CT scans myself because I'm getting really good I've gotten really good to uh, read these things and um, I mean you really can't see cer certain hernias that you can see on other imaging so the smaller ones, for sure, CT scans are horrible in evaluating the pelvis. The medium to large ones, it's, very, it's good, but um, don't rely on the radiologist to let you know you should read it yourself. Um, again, going back to what I said earlier, 75% of radiology reports are incorrect. And so um, uh, if you look at the numbers, the MRI is so much better than CT scan, uh, at least at least almost twice as better. So um, I've been thinking about why CT scan is not so good. Uh, I think from a radiologist standpoint, they don't care about hernias. They talk about cancer and colon and pancreas and, and uh, other, other things. And abdominal wall is very low priority for them. Hernias are not priority for them. And, um, you know what, radiologists sometimes don't even know what a hernia is. They think an intestine needs to go in there or there needs to be a hernia sac, and that's just not true. So besides the fact that CT scan is, has poor sensitivity in the pelvis, um, and it's overall not a good study uh, for soft tissue because there's poor definition of soft tissue on the CT scan, um, uh, this radiologists don't, still aren't very good at reporting um, most hernias. So let me show you what I mean by that. So this is a patient. This is a patient with groin pain on the left side and some bladder issues um, after an ingle hernia repair. In the CT scan, if you look carefully, um, no hernia. This is uh, the bladder. And if you look, there's the bladder's a little asymmetric. Uh, here's some contrast in the bladder. Uh, it's a little bit distorted on this side compared to the right side. 
and then here you have this gray thing that you don't have on the right side. This is what a mesh shoma looks like, often with a mesh plug. So if you have a mesh plug that's deep in the story of the bladder, um, uh, that may or may not be the cause of the, the groin pain. CT scan may hint on this, uh, but look, the mesh and the muscle, and even the urine, same color. Um, not very good at differentiating uh, soft tissue and muscle and so on using a CAT scan. Uh, the mesh, you can't even tell like where it stops and where the muscle begins. And sometimes, not for this, not for this specific situation, but sometimes you really want to know is the mesh folded or is there a hernia recurrence around the mesh. Um, and the CT scan cannot give you the answer to most of those because the muscle and the mesh are the same color. So here's a situation. Um, so when you're looking at patients who've had hernias before, uh, their mesh is often also gray. So polypropylene will look gray. PTFE or Gore-Tex mesh would be bright white. So that's lucky. You know, if you get a patient, um, we don't see that too, many, too often anymore. But if you do have a patient who has um, uh, PTFE or Gore-Tex mesh, you can look see see the mesh very clearly uh, on the CT scan. In this patient, they had an ingle hernia mesh, and here it is right there. And they present um, several years after surgery with right groin pain. And you know what? The radiologist looked at this and said, mesh uh, looks like there's been a hernia repair with post-op changes. And all of this, they basically said, is a scar. So this is um, what they expect to see after a hernia repair. Not true. You should not see this much scar or so far, many years after surgery, number one. Um, but a CT scan does not give you very good uh, direction as to what that scar is. So let's review this. This is a axial view of the imaging. Your two hip, hip joints. Here's your bladder with some contrast in it. Rectum behind here, and this is the coccyx and sacrum. Here you have your two rectus muscles on the left side. Here's your uh, groin. There's scar tissue from prior hernia repair, maybe. Um, I don't see the mesh here. There may have been a mesh. And these are the contents going into the groin. Um, this is a non -con this is a contrast scan because there's contrast in the bladder. But as you can see, the uh, femoral, the, the extra iliac vein and artery, extra iliac vein and artery are not very brightly lit up. So that's a, kind of a a timing issue with the CAT scan, and um, uh, I don't see a hernia recurrence. All I see is this mesh, which looks appropriate, and all this gray stuff, and I can't figure out what that gray stuff is. However, if you get an MRI in the same exact patient, look at this. All this bright white. This is not scar. This is not typical post-op reaction. This is what you see with mesh infection. So you have a massive inflammatory reaction, maybe some fluid. You can see that the fluid are in the hip joints on both sides and the fluid in the bladder in this, in this non-contrast MRI is white. And this has got this uh, white tinge to it as well. Here are little um, vessels and lymphatics which are also white. So what you have is that this is MRI, very different study. Bladder is white. The articular fluid in the hip is white. This is your hip joint right here. Um, here's your rectum back here. A poor definition of the muscles on this type of MRI image. Doesn't matter. There are other images you can look at. Um, left side, so these are your vessels. Right side, your vessels. And then massive amount of inflammation. Consistent with a probable mesh infection in this patient many years postoperatively. Okay, another CT scan, different patient, also complaining of right groin pain and bulging. Um, you can see that this is a, an axial study. Here again, here's your pelvis with the hip joints on both sides. You have the bladder there's, um, and uh, the rectum here. So on this CT scan, you have um, bulging on the right groin. You can see the right side on the mons is more bulging than on the left side. 
and they put these these stickers here which suggest where the pain is and there's this flute this gray and we can't figure out what this gray is and then dun 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 you look at the same MRI and you can tell that there's a fluid collection in this right groin what that's the reason why the right side is bulging um, and this is again a uh, fluid collection could be seroma could be uh, in, uh, infected fluid um, uh, so basically uh, much more information on this MRI so I made a I gave a little brief on patients with occult angle hernias that's a lot of my practice are these people with chronic pelvic pain or groin pain, no one can figure out what it is. In fact, it's due to an inguinal hernia, but it's not a large inguinal hernia, it's a very small inguinal hernia. And in patients with small inguinal hernias, what happens is that they have um, a little bit of fat in the inguinal canal, not enough to cause a big bulge, but enough to cause um, pressure and pain in the groin. And often uh, more of a problem in females than males because the females have a much smaller um, width to the inguinal canal and are, are more sensitive to content within it than males. However, to be able to diagnose these patients, besides a good history and physical exam, it's very important before you operate on them to get some type of um, imaging because the, because the a physical exam is never diagnostic. And so uh, it's important to understand the limitations of imaging when you order these uh, studies for occult inguinal hernias. So when we looked at only the patients with occult hernias on exam, we found that the CT scan uh, sensitivity dropped from 77% to 54% um, without any change in its specificity. So again, if the CT scan shows it, that's great, but it's, it's even less likely to be um, positive, correctly positive. Um, the positive predict predictive value drops and uh, remains a high negative predictive value with the occult inguinal hernia. So CT scan is not a good study um, uh, to rule out occult inguinal hernia. Look at that, 6% negative predictive value, just not enough. If you do wish to order a CT scan, I do recommend a CT pelvis with Valsalva. Most of these patients that, that have these difficult to read or misdiagnoses on CT scan is because there is no Valsalva um, dy dynamic part of the image. Um, and so I think you can get a much better, um, much better view of the pelvis, at least if you add a Valsalva to it. Very easy, quick. Um, I do not think you need IV contrast. Uh, it complicates the whole situation, adds extra costs and complications. So I do recommend oral contrast that will help at least differentiate where the bowel is. So I order my CT scan that's a pelvis with Valsalva and with oral contrast, no IV contrast. And I will finish this discussion uh, by talking about MRIs for growing pain. Uh, I've become a very, very um, big advocate of using MRIs for my patients with groin pain because it is so, so helpful, but it's very, very difficult to read these. Um, so MRI is highly reliable for soft tissue and musculoskeletal disorders, which basically the pelvic uh, region and pelvic, pelvic floor is. Um, there's no involved radiation, so there's less risk to the patient. Uh, and if you look at these numbers, we looked at our patients, a positive predictive value and a negative predictive value, fairly high for MRI, 97% and 79%, the best negative predictive value study. So if you really want to know, um, uh, MRI is the best study to order um, uh, if, you, if you don't if you have a good ultrasonographer. It's very expensive. Um, most... Cities do not have MRI, although that's changing, but I think uh, specifically in outside of the United States, it's even more difficult to get MRI access. Um, it's hard to read it. It took me a while to learn how to read MRIs. It's very different than CT scans, much more complicated. They give you a lot more um, images to, to review. Uh, it's for sure not patient-friendly. It takes a long time to get the uh, imaging 
uh, captured. If any of you have ever had MRIs, I've had multiple MRIs myself. Um, it's just claustrophobic and there's so much noise and I hate MRIs personally, uh, but I order them from my patients all the time. So <laughs> it's a good thing, but it's, uh, you know, it's, it's a painful thing to, to, to go through. So here is what an MRI looks like. You've got, uh, here's your hip bone, this is the right side. So the coloring is, scheme is totally different than a CT scan. Here's your bladder, um, here's uh, some bowel, here's your pubic synthesis, there's your two bones, your pubic synthesis. All this dark gray is muscle. This light, lighter gray is um, your right hip joint. And as we move anteriorly in this axial, in this uh, coronal view, uh, you can see that now you're starting to see the, the vessels, the extrailiac uh, vein and artery uh, transitioning onto the femoral vein and artery. And uh, here are your uh, femoral vessels. And then uh, you're starting to see the incoming uh, the, of the spermatic cord um, with the vessels uh, involved in that. And then voila, you've got fat, which is preperitoneal fat entering the inguinal canal, following the spermatic cord down towards the testicle. This, my friends, is an inguinal hernia. Very clearly seen. Same patient, this is a, sag this is a sagittal view. So here's the pelvic floor, uh, pubic tubercle, there's the penis there, you have the rectum, um, uh, and the bladder, and here's the uh, abdominal wall. So here's the abdominal wall coming down, inserting on the pubic bone. This is your inguinal canal. You can see there's a little bit of white in there consistent with fat in the canal. Here's a very clear amount of fat that should not be there that's like a cord lipoma um, or possibly intraperitoneal fat through the inguinal canal, which is preperitoneal fat, um, causing uh, inguinal hernia down in on the right side. So again, MRI, we know uh, it's pretty good uh, for all patients uh, looking for inguinal canals. Positive predictive value is very high. 97% negative predictive value, also the highest of all the other images. For all inguinal hernias, 79%. And then looking specifically at the very difficult to diagnose, and very difficult to see, smaller inguinal hernias, which we call occult hernias, which are not typically um, bulging and are hard to diagnose on exam alone. Also really, really good, 95% positive predictive value and 85% negative predictive value. And um, for sure, of all these numbers, uh, MRI is the best study for occult inguinal hernias. So here you have an MRI. Um, this is an axial view. White is fat. So you have white all across. You don't see the skin. This is the fat underneath the skin. Here's your rectus muscles. Here's your intra-abdominal contents with the black being the intestines and the white being the fat. Here's a little bit of pubic, uh, pelvic bone on either side. And uh, what you have here is, again, your, um, your uh, abdominal wall down low in the pelvis, and you start to see an, a gap here, and a gap here, and a gap here. So you have a little bit of fat going into this inguinal hernia. That's a left inguinal, that's a right inguinal, and then that may be a small femoral hernia. So um, again, these are areas, there's a gap in the muscle there, a gap in the muscle there with fat content. You should no normally see in a patient with no hernia, you should see this muscle go all the way across, which you don't. So the way to order an MRI is to ask for um, so I have what's called a hernia protocol. I work with my radiologist. And so I basically order a MRI hernia protocol. It's a dynamic study. If you wish, you can um, be a little bit more specific. You, uh, every, every hospital has a different ling lingo or language as to how it uh, talks about MRIs. Um, some, some do a pubalgia study. Some do what's called an anterior soft tissue study. Otherwise, they'll do a sacral 
imaging. You don't want the sacrum, you want the anterior soft tissue. Um, you do not need any contrast for MRI. It's a plain, straight MRI. No oral contrast, no IV contrast. I do recommend it be done with Valsalva. We've seen in our study that those done with Valsalva show much, much better definition for the occult angle hernias. Um, make sure they provide you with the sagittal and coronal views in addition to the axial views. Sometimes they don't print out the, ax the uh, sagittal views. And in fact, the sagittal views are the most sensitive views to look for small inguinal hernias. Um, if you are curious as to what our protocol is on the uh, Facebook group of the IHC, the International Hernia Collaboration, which I hope every single one of you are signed up to be involved with because it's an excellent, excellent educational um, uh, a platform for hernias uh, among colleagues. Uh, the the di MRI dynamic protocol is uh, listed there, so just search the Facebook group and you can take that uh, order and show it to your radiologist. Um, also on herniatalk.com, um, which is a patient discussion forum, the um, MRI protocol has been uh, published. So last, last slide. This is the algorithm that I use in trying to um, treat patients. If you have a high clinical suspicion for inguinal hernia, and on diagnosis, on um, the exam is diagnostic, so you do an exam, you're like, that's an inguinal hernia, then the patient can move on to a hernia repair, um, or you can choose to do an ultrasound if you want more information, and then do the hernia repair. This side is a typical patient with a bulging symptomatic inguinal hernia. On this other side, if you have a, a non-diagnostic exam, you're clinically highly suspicious that the patient has an inguinal hernia, but you have a non-diagnostic exam, possibly a hidden hernia, you can either get an ultrasound or an MRI. I don't recommend the CT scan, ultrasound or MRI. If the MRI shows there's a hernia and there needs to be, uh, and clinically you feel it needs to be repaired, fine. If the MRI doesn't show anything, then you're done. If you get an ultrasound and that shows a hernia and you feel it needs to be repaired, fine, get it repaired. If the ultrasound or CT scan does not show anything and the patient still has a high clinical suspicion for inguinal hernia, do not stop there move on to get more information. These ultrasounds and CT scans are highly, highly often falsely negative. And so I hope the takeaway is if the ultrasound is positive, go forward. If the ultrasound or CT scan is negative and you have a high clinical suspicion, move on to an MRI if you can. And um, if that does show a hernia, you feel that needs to be uh, repaired, that is a recording. So, muchísimas gracias for everything and for your time and for your attention. Um, I'm available on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram, or you can email me if you would like um, any questions answered. Please, please go to the Facebook group, the IHC International Hernia Collaboration, um, where we can all discuss um, everything you want to know about hernias. Um, outside of your class. Best of luck on your diploma. Um, felicitaciones to everyone um, who will complete this. And thank you again, Evelyn, for um, your gracious invitation to allow me to be part of your class. Thank you very much.